Hi, everyone. We're here for residencies and retreats, getting the most out of the experience. This is part of our ongoing series, Business Boot Camps for Writers, put on by the Authors Guild Foundation. And it's funded in part by the National Endowment for the Arts and by Penguin Random House. So thank you to all our sponsors. And this webinar was, was produced with two of our partner organizations, the Asian American Writers Workshop, which helps develop, publish, and promote creative writing by Asian Americans and by the Institute of American Indian Arts, which offers a low residency MFA in creative writing. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions in advance to help shape this panel. And you can use the Zoom Q&A box here to add additional questions, which we'll get to toward the end of the hour. Um, I'd also like to say our friend, Lily Philpot. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, she has ties to both AAWW and IAIA. Uh, she created an info sheet on residencies, a spreadsheet with information like the duration, application fees, links to the guidelines and things like that for dozens of residencies. So I'll share that with you all in the chat box and email it to you later. Um, thank you, Lily. And now I would like to turn things over to our moderator, Deborah Taffa. Deborah is the director of the MFA Creative Writing Program at IAIA in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Her memoir, Whiskey Tender, won the Penn Jean Stein Grant and is forthcoming from HarperCollins Harper later this year. She's a McDowell, Hedgebrook, Tin House, and Kranzberg Fellow. She's from the Quechan Nation and Laguna Pueblo, and she earned a nonfiction MFA in Iowa City. Uh, Deborah and all our panelists, welcome and thank you so much. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Johnny. Um, welcome everyone to Residencies and Retreats, Getting the Most Out of the Experience. Today, we're going to be talking about places that accept writers, visual artists, and sometimes composers, academics, and activists for short or longer term residencies. So we've put together a panel today of writers who have um, won their share of fellowships and uh, residencies, and I'm going to be introducing them to you by in alphabetical order. First, we have Tracy Abeta. She is a Native American Latinx third grade dropout who didn't get a GED, but did snag two master's degrees. After she turned 40, she decided to write for real and has been published by Hobart Pulp, The Brooklyn Review, Malivia Street and Diagram. Last year, she attended Disquiet in Portugal and the International Literary Seminars Program in Kenya as a fiction contest finalist and is working on an MFA in fiction from the Institute for American Indian Arts. She teaches literature and lives in Oakland with a free roaming lion head rabbit named Betty, who is two pounds but can eat a tunnel through a couch. Next up, we have, hi Tracy, <laughs> welcome. Next up, we have Hannah Bay, is a Korean American freelance journalist, nonfiction writer and illustrator who is at work on a memoir about family estrangement and mental illness. She is the 2020 nonfiction winner of the Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award and a 2021 and 2022 Peter Taylor Fellow for the Kenyan Review Writers Workshops. You can find her work in anthologies such as Our Red Book, Intimate Histories of Periods, Growing and Changing and Don't Call Me Crazy, 33 Voices Start the Conversation About Mental Health, and online at Asian American Writers Workshops the Margins, Catapult, The Washington Post, The San Francisco Chronicle, and other outlets. Next up, we have Brandon Hobson. He is a 2022 Guggenheim Fellow. He received his PhD from Oklahoma State University. His novel, Where the Dead Sit Talking, was a finalist for the National Book Award, winner of the Reading the West Award, and longlisted for the Dublin Literary Award, among other distinctions. His short stories have won a Pushcart Prize and have appeared in the Best American Short Stories, McSweeney's, Conjunctions, Noon, and elsewhere. He teaches creative writing at New Mexico State University and at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and he is the editor of Puerto del Sol. He is an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation tribe of Oklahoma. Hi, Brennan. And last but not least, we have Abir Hawk a Nigerian-born Bangladeshi-American writer and photographer. She likes chilies, silver, and knowing what's what. Her books include a coffee table book, The Long Way Home, published in 2013, a linked collection of stories, poems, and photographs, The Lovers and the Leavers, 2015, and a memoir, all of which 
which was published in 2017. She has won fellowships from the NEA, Queen's Council on the Arts, NYFA, and the Fulbright Foundation, and holds a BS and MA, both from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business, as well as an MFA in writing from the University of San Francisco. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you today. Happy spring. So the first question I think we're just going to start off with is a very general question, and we'll start with Tracy. Um, how does a writer know when they are ready to apply for a fellowship or a residency or um, a retreat? I don't know that I was ready to apply to one, and I'm glad that somebody, I had a friend who suggested disquiet to me, and I thought I wasn't ready, but I had taken a bunch of, um, you know, piecemeal classes and took some community college classes, classes online. And this person suggested that I needed a writing community. And before I had applied to grad school, um, they told me to think about this version of creating a writing community before I applied to grad school to see if, you know, I really wanted to take my writing to the next level. And so I did apply and um, was very nervous about it. Uh, and so I don't, I mean, I think that I didn't think I was ready, but then when I got there, I felt pretty comfortable um, with the people and the writing that I was looking at. I felt like I did fit in. So I'm not sure if you should feel ready, I guess is my answer um, completely. I don't know if you ever feel ready. I'm such a new writer. Um, it's hard for me to answer that question. So maybe I'm sure other people have better answers, but I would say that um, you should definitely probably have, uh, you know, a couple completed short stories. Um, I don't think you have to, you know, finish a novel, maybe like if you're writing a novel, maybe the first 20 to 40 pages, because you do have to submit something most often um, if it's uh, if it's a retreat or residency where they're going to review your manuscript. But I would say just to do that, to feel like, you know, you accomplish some things and maybe if you published a, a short story would be good. That's my guess. Um, I can pick it up from here. Tracy, I think that's actually a really wonderful answer because I think truly anyone can benefit at any stage in their writing process, um, depending on the residency and the space. Um, I applied to my first residency in uh, 2019, so pre-pandemic, um, but didn't actually get to go until 2021 because I was uh, not ready to, to be in a residential setting um, until I was vaccinated. Um, but the reason why I applied to that residency was because it was in a really convenient location. Um, I had family in um, an area of Northwest Arkansas. And so I had known about a particular residency called the Writers Colony at Dairy Hollow. And they had a fellowship specifically for writers writing about mental illness. And so I thought it was kind of like kismet, like I had to apply for this. And then I ended up winning that fellowship, which gave me a two week stay. Um, and it actually was, it didn't end up being the first residency or retreat that I was able to go on because the pandemic disrupted things so much. But um, when I finally did get to go to, um, you know, a writing space, it was actually a paid retreat that I, um, that I looked for. I, I wanted to go somewhere within driving distance of my home in the New York area because it was still the pandemic. Um, that had a private living space, private bathroom, and um, meals cooked for me that I could take back to my private workspace. This is pre-vaccination, so I wanted to be really careful. And um, I had heard great things about the Highlights Foundation in Pennsylvania. Um, it's in the Poconos. And so while I did pay money to go, um, it was a wonderful space. And I've heard great things about their workshops specifically for people who are um, in children's literature, but while I don't work primarily in children's literature, I found it to be a great place to do an unstructured solo workshop, um, a solo retreat. And um, at that point, I was so, so burnt out from being just stuck at home and feeling quite immobilized and unable to write because of all the grief that I was 
experiencing through the pandemic. Um, and I'm so glad that I just got time in a quiet setting away from all domestic responsibilities to really focus on myself. And it was just like three days, but it made a world of difference. So I would say if you are just dying to get away, um, paying for a retreat is a wonderful option, but that's just a little bit about my experience. I, I want to echo that as well. Sorry, Brand, Brandon, I told no, you. That. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, I, I did my first retreat like in uh, 2009, which was when uh, the pandemic was just a glint in SARS's eye or something. Um, <laughs> but um, I, and, and so I would echo what the, um, you know, Tracy and Hannah, uh, uh, Hannah Bay said to apply if you just have like, a piece of writing that you think is good enough to include in your portfolio. But otherwise, I think it totally doesn't, uh, you know, like uh, writers at any stage um, should apply. Um, but the one thing that I really loved about my first residency, which was Saltonstall, which is a New York re state residence only residency, which I uh, highly recommend to any New York City or other New York State residents because it's because it's not national, it's a little bit less competitive, although it's I think probably all the residencies are a little competitive. But when I got there, um, I was in between writing projects and the director of the program at the time said this thing that stayed with me for every other residency I've done since, which is she didn't care what we did with our time. We could just, you know, sit in our rooms and cry, or we could read, or we could go for walks in the marshes. We could do whatever we wanted. It's in this beautiful place in Ithaca where there are actually gorges and mar marshes everywhere. Um, and and because I was in between projects, that's actually what I did. I read a lot, maybe cried a little, um, sent my um, unpublished, I had, you know, two unpublished manuscripts at the time, which would not get published for several more years, but I sent them out to a bunch of contests and so on. And so I want to encourage people <clears throat> to apply for residencies. Um, you, it's nice to have a project in mind. Um, you know, to work on because you can get so much done because you're away from your usual life. And so you can have a really focused writing experience, but you could also, wow. like I did, um, just read a lot and just, you know, think about, think about what you want to write. Um, yeah, I don't know what I can add that hasn't already been said. Um, I do think that one thing that was helpful for me um, was and and um, I went to U Cross, um, and it's just such a beautiful space. I, and my writing studio was right outside a lake, um, and um, you know that th th there's something about not having to worry about making meals um, or or running errands that all day. Um, you're just really sort of catered to, and at least at UCross, they would bring your lunch to you, um, to your, to your studio. Um, and there were some days I didn't write at all, but that I, um, went on a walk and, um, you know, just really sort of, uh, enjoyed the silence and the solitude, um, which, um, functions on a whole different level, right, than, than, than a work level. And um, so, I, you know, I think any stage is real important. I think um, I was able to really find inspiration and create new work, but at the same time, it was really helpful that I could um, have all this time by myself where I could go through a manuscript and um, spend a lot of time revising. And it's just, it's, it's really nice that how how catered to you are there and um uh so yeah i just can't really um emphasize that enough how important that freedom from responsibility um of that you know we all have things in our schedule um and and it's nice to be able to to go there and not really have to worry about about anything, there were where there were days I would just read um, in my studio and just sort of lie down on the couch, um, and and take walks and and that kind of thing. Yeah. So to recap um, for the audience, I I guess what everyone we're hearing, they're all unifying in the in the idea that if it's a twenty page application and you have twenty stellar pages. 
that you know sounds right to you and it's ready, then you are ready to apply to a residency, certainly. And another common theme I'm hearing is this idea that, you know, we know that writing is a mirror to the self. When you go to a place that's so quiet, suddenly you're confronted with a stillness that none of us are afforded in our day to day life. And that can be challenging. Um, and so I, I guess we'll maybe try to go around and talk about the challenges of being at residency. How do you protect and prepare yourself for that space and that time when you're doing so much deep reflecting and there's the pressure to create writing um, in a set period of time? Deborah, I can go ahead and jump in on this one. Um, I think especially for BIPOC writers, Black, Indigenous, or people of color, um, residencies uh, can open us up to new experiences that can seem a little scary, like being in a new social setting, especially for me traveling post-pandemic. It's been, I, I have felt a lot of unease being away from home at times. Um, and part of that is my, my own fear related to anti-Asian hate. Um, and I know it's a fear that many people of marginalized communities have faced their entire lives. Um, but I think knowing that you're there to focus on yourself foremost and your art is really important to keep in mind. Your, your goal is not to uh, change everyone's hearts and minds, um, even though Sometimes in our regular everyday lives, that might be our goal to like make lots of friends and network and all of that. But um, I really, I really try to make my time at residencies focused on the writing and, and taking care of myself. And I've also heard from other friends who have gone to residencies that they don't feel a responsibility to like educate people on, um, on race or issues of being marginalized or anything like that. Um, if you hear those kinds of discussions, and you uh, don't want to participate, it is totally okay to walk away and just take time for yourself and protect your headspace. Um, I've had friends say that they don't like to leave the actual residency grounds um, unless they know it's going to be okay. Like, um, I don't know, some, some residencies are located in areas that have like great thrifting or vintage shopping, but those can also be prime ground for finding like really troubling uh, historical artifacts or uh, garments or decor. So it's like, don't, don't even, don't even open yourself up if, if, to that if you don't want to. Um, and if you just want to like, keep your headspace protected. Um, I wrote a piece about this for Catapult, which I can share. Um, that's specifically for people of color going to residencies. Um, but yeah, I, I think just know that you are your priority. Hannah, I, I read your article just recently, Hannah Bay. I'm so, and it was it was so good because I, I realized that every residency I've gone to has been uh, totally uh, white dominated. Like I've often been the only POC in the residency. Even at this one, I went to um, VCCA, which has up to like 20 or 25 people. And it was actually a smaller group because they were uh, renovating the artist studio. So there's only one artist there, visual artist. Um, and even there, there was only one other POC out of like more than 20 people. And so my experience has always been in white spaces, which um, in a way I didn't even recognize because that's, you know, what we're used, used to uh, as people of color is being in these spaces. Um, so that's one, one thing that I, um, you know, really appreciated in your article was talking about that, like actually just, you know, acknowledging it, which is something I'd not even allowed myself to acknowledge because in many ways that's not gonna change. But I will um, address a couple of things um, that have also come up in the Q and A's, which is uh, kind of, and also um, Johnny had um, mentioned this, is the differences between residencies and fellowships. So residencies um, are generally, at, at least as I understand them, um, these places that will give you a fellowship perhaps to come to a beautiful space where you get your own writing studio and a uh, private room to sleep in. And so you get um, anywhere from like a few days to a, a month or sometimes two months um, to work on a project or uh, whatever creative project you, you're in. And many of them are open to writers, largely are like um, the big section, but there's also visual artists. And there's ones like VCCA had ones for composers. So did Malay, which is also wonderful because I feel like the kind of the uh, bringing together of all these different art forms can be super inspiring for me to 
talk to other people who are thinking about art and expressing themselves in very different ways than I know. I will just mention one more thing, which is um, the pressure of having to get things done because you have all this like, un, um, you know, sort of unstructured time can be kind of a lot, you know, like I've, I've gone to residencies being like, I will rewrite my entire novel in these six weeks that I have. And it's, it's that's a lot to put on yourself. And so I do want to, um, you know, encourage people to give yourself space. I have a friend who says they spend the first, they set aside the first week just to acclimate. And then the last week, uh, you know, just to kind of like review. And so you can maybe if you shorten the amount of time that you're giving yourself pressure to actually produce, um, that might be uh, helpful for you to um, not feel, you know, so much pressure about the time that you're there. Brandon, would you add anything about the length of time that people opt to stay or about personal experiences you've had kind of coming up against the diversity of people that go to residencies? Yeah, I, I mean, I will say, I, I mean, at UCross, um, it, the, when I was there, and I was there on a fellowship, um, but it was, a, I guess the, what I liked about UCross is there were composers uh, visual artists and writers all sort of mixed together. I had, um, and I have uh, some social anxiety. And, and so when I was, when I was there the first day, um, I was a little bit sort of shy about um, um, sort of congregating with, with people. And um, so I spent the the first day, uh, you know, worried about this stuff and and um, this, the whole social uh, component to it. So I spent a lot of time in my studio the first day. But then we, you know, you come together for for community dinners, which you don't have to. Um, but I, you know, when I started going to those, um, and and got, to, I just ended up really, really loving everybody there. It was it was amazing. And uh, so I, you know, I mean that. I, I think Abir is correct that it's a lot of pressure that you can put on your on yourself to to go to a residency. And um, so, it, you know, I, I, I think giving yourself the freedom to say, I may not do anything except think today, right, or take notes. And that's a that's a totally like, I mean, writers need time to think. And it's really hard, <laughs> you know, we have to work in solitude and we have to find the space in our lives to where, I mean, not just writing, but so much so much of it is, is a form of thinking, right? And so there, it's just nice to be able to, to, to be able to do that, whether that's outside or, um, you know, um, or, or inside somewhere. But I, I did have some, um, uh, some, some anxiety about the, the residency um that first day and and so i was lucky that it was a it was a really nice diverse group uh mm -hmm. of people that that were there and and i think everybody goes uh, i after talking to everybody kind of felt the same way i think and um you know it it, it says a lot to be able to um uh to to uh have those community dinners or talk with people and sort of realize everybody's feeling the exact same way right mm -hmm. so, yeah it's yeah. a great wonderful yeah. yeah i've talked to a lot of directors of residencies for my work trying to create um, a relationship with them so my students can go to their you know to go write at their places and one thing that everyone talks about is the need for diversity and when i say diversity i'm not just talking about like cultural diversity but also there will be very advanced writers at a residency along with kind of newer writers and then if you have musicians or visual artists thrown into the mix and you can you can relax and trust and and not create a hierarchy in your mind so much as sort of a field of people doing different things at different levels the conversations that are generated in those spaces um if you can get out of yourself a little bit um i think is very worthwhile you know it's very worthwhile but i love that everybody's saying that you can also just protect your time and be as sort of solo as you want to be because artists are always a little bit sensitive i would just kind of 
uh, make a general statement, maybe that isn't completely true, but feels true to me that a lot of us feel self-conscious when we get into group settings because we spend so much time alone creating, right? Um, we've had somebody who is asking the difference, how we would define the difference between a fellowship and a residency. So I know like Tracy hasn't been to her traditional residency. She's gotten fellowships to go to. How would we define the difference between the two? Um, do you want to take a stab at that, Tracy? I think it's sounding, you're right. I haven't been to a residency because I think that that's where you get your own space and you're just creating on your own, perhaps. Um, and what I've been to, it's sort of a mix, you know, but you have to do some collaborating, you know, looking at manuscripts together in the morning or taking a craft class. And then you do get some time on your own. So it's kind of like a blend. And I think everything I've been to, you do get your food and which is nice, you know, not having to take care of yourself. Um, but with that comes a little bit more of a social atmosphere, um, questions, you know, about your manuscript everything I write includes something about, you know, my cultural background. And so there'll be these questions that are personal. Um, and it feels like I'm getting taken off the track of writing, you know, it's, I don't know. So I don't, so I have to like kind of reroute those conversations. Um, sorry, what was the original question that the uh, difference between residencies and fellowships. Yeah, so I think that um, I'm looking forward to someday <laughs> getting into a residency where I can just work, but I will counter that with saying this. Um, when you're around so many artists, I do feel like something different happens, and it's not like right at first, but a few days in, I get really, really creative, and by the time I leave, I'm kind of upset that I'm not in that atmosphere, and this last time I went to something, I was on the airplane and I wrote like hours on the airplane um, and it stuck with me for a few days and then it went away. And so being around so many creative people also just will do something to you where you feel creative with all this energy around you. I will also add to that, that there are fellowships where there is no social component. I've gotten fellowships like the Fulbright Fellowship or the uh, NEA or the NIFA, where you just get a chunk of money. Um, mm -hmm. That's just a fellowship um, and you can do whatever you want with it. I use one of my fellowships to pay rent um, and there's no social component at all. It's just money to help you work on the project that you want to work on. So there are those kinds of fellowships as well. But a residency generally is something where you go somewhere and they give you a, a writing studio or an art studio to make work. Mm -hmm. What about what if we jump to tips about filling out the application? Does anybody have any tips for filling out the application that they want to share? So um, I know that Abir teaches an amazing class about uh, writing artist statements. And I will say that in my experience, after I write about you know, one artist statement, you can kind of use it for dozens of other applications. So I just like change the names of, you know, like, I'm so excited to come to the X place and, and, uh, and, and like tweak accordingly. I do make sure to, to read very carefully about each specific residency. So if it's like a large cohort, um, like Ragdale um, in Illinois, for example, I'm going to say something about like being excited to be in the company of other artists. But if I know it's somewhere where I might be the only person there, I'm not I'm not going to include that line in the statement. I will also say that um, it is really important to, to just kind of have a baseline of understanding of um, what the place is. Um, often there's like an about this residency page, um, and that can be really helpful. Like um, one residency that I got to go to was called the Peter Bulla Foundation, and that's in Winchester, Virginia. And um, it's really, uh, you know, built around one person's legacy. So I think it really does behoove people to who are applying to know about just a little bit about the person and uh, and why specifically you might be interested. Um, for me, I also am from the state of Virginia, and I thought it would be a really great time to be able to go back and just spend time in my former home state uh, working on my my writing. Um, but other people are like, I don't, I didn't care. I, uh, I, I just wanted to have some time and space, no matter where. And I'll tell you, like, that's not what a residency staffer like wants to hear in an application or interview. 
you didn't. I, I I just, oh, sorry. Did I? I didn't I mean go ahead. Did I interrupt somebody? Sorry. Okay. No. Um. I, I mean, I just the, very quickly. I was just going to say, um, talking very specifically about your project. Um. I. I it, and I, I I served on I served as a reader on, for um, for a residency and I, I think one of the things that's really important is why your project is is so important is very um, I think to uh, to talk about to mention um, obviously you're going to send your best work but but being able to, I think, you know, there's something to be said about being able to talk about, about your work and its importance, not just to you, but um, to others as well, right? Sorry. I was just going to chime in and say, be yourself in the artist statement or statement of purpose. Be weird. Fly your freak flag. Say what you want to say. I try to have fun writing anything, you know, my bio, my artist statement. My artist statement makes a reference to Paul Dano and the Auto Zone. And somehow it got me into Kenyon Review this summer, you know, because I think I'm being true to myself. I try to be funny, but my writing, I always want to incorporate humor. So if that's not you, don't be that, but be yourself and have a personality. Because remember, you're trying to get people to hang out with you. So, you know, I mean, don't put something on that's not true to yourself, but actually be honest and have your voice and personality in the artist statement and the statement of purpose. Um, Cause I'm sure people read these by the hundreds and maybe a lot of them start out with, I've always been a reader or, you know, I don't, I'm not sure, but just launch into yourself and, and what you want to um convey to the reader, but also uh, entertain them a little. I think that's that's my advice. So I, I wanna jump in, I have, I have so much to say, but I will just say this um, because I do teach a class. Um, I used to teach it for Catapult um, many times until Catapult went kaput. Um, and so I'm now teaching it for um, a lovely co-op that's just started in Brooklyn, but I'll just, just at the risk of like promoting myself, here's the here's the uh, class. But um, what I also I'll always tell, we spend a lot of time talking about how to write a personal statement. And you know, like Brandon was saying, knowing why your project is important to you, it is important. You just have to know how to talk about that. Um, is really is really great. And on being able to talk about your works, which is a different kind of writing than actually writing, um, is really these are all really important aspects of the personal statement or the statement of purpose. But I will say for applying for residencies and um, and fellowships, the thing that's the most important, no matter how much, and, and I think it's really good to spend a lot of time on your personal statement because it gives you clarity and confidence about your project. But the most important part is your writing sample. And so you really want to make sure that whatever you send is kind of the strongest piece that you have. As someone who's been on the sort of judging or whatever peer review um, side of residencies and fellowships. I've, I've done it for Fulbright, for NEA, for NIFA, and for Malay um, residencies. Um, I will say that uh, the personal statement is great. It gives us some context, but what we look at is the actual writing sample. And it doesn't, you know, it just has to be something that grabs you and it's so subjective, right? Um, and whoever the you know person is, there's usually a panel of like anywhere from two to five people who are looking at your thing. Um, you want to just send the writing sample that's kind of the you know just the, your strongest work basically. So that's the uh, that's my <laughs> very short answer to. Abir, people are asking whether or not you are going to be teaching that class again at any point. Yeah, yeah. And the, the link I dropped into the uh, chat is actually my next class that I'm going to be teaching in June. So wonderful. Hannah, were you going to say something? Yes, just to jump off of what Abir is saying, I really do think the number one most important component of an application is the writing sample. If you're a writer, the work sample. Um, I have also been privileged enough to review applications to residencies, and it doesn't matter how many accolades you are, you have. Um, or how many fellowships you've had in the past, the writing sample is the most important. 
I have uh, been blown away by people who are, you know, unpublished or um, have published very, you know, they're very early in their pub very early in their publishing journey. And it doesn't matter if the writing sample sparkles. And so I've seen some questions in the chat about like, I am of a certain age and I'm wondering if residencies are only for people with like X number of accolades or like at this number, at, at this age, like under 35 or so. And I say, that's absolutely not true. I'm over 35. I believe Tracy had mentioned in her bio that she started writing in her forties. Um, and I have been at residencies with people, you know, many, many decades older than me um, who have been through totally different phases of life. So I do think that it, like age is not a determining factor. It's about the writing. It's about the art. Oh, if you're going to turn in a writing sample for a review, like other people are going to look at it. I would say always start with the beginning if it's a novel. Um, that probably sounds obvious, but a lot of us have read like pieces in the middle, but we don't know the setup. So it's a little bit harder to give feedback. Um, so I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah, some people have been asking too about whether or not you get professional feedback on writing before you will submit it. If you only submit things that have been published prior, um, or if you, you know, like what is your process in determining that a piece of writing is ready to go? I mean, I think you can, um, hopefully your writing process would involve some level of feedback from others. I feel like going through, like my my writing is never as good as when it's gone through at least three or four <laughs> drafts with multiple people looking at it. And so that's what I would encourage everybody who, you know, if you haven't had something published, which uh, assume, you know, you're assuming if something's published, it's been vetted by this publication. And so that's good to go. But if you're submitting something that's not published, that you would have some, um, you know, some, some other set of eyes on it that has given you feedback and you've gone through it. And that's, you're now confident that it doesn't have to be finished, but it has to be strong enough that you think that it'll get you somewhere. Brandon, anything on that, on knowing when something's ready or how you create community around getting something ready? Yeah, I mean, I think I would agree. I, I uh, write multi-drafts um, and rewrite um, even from the beginning if I'm working on something. But I think, I, I mean, I think something else is even if it's an excerpt, a novel excerpt, as Tracy mentioned from the very beginning, um, if it can be a standalone write, um, chapter as as much as possible um i i, I think uh, i mean again it is it's also subjective because what one person likes another person may not like of course um we all know this but i i think it's absolutely crucial i 100 percent agree with what with what the others are saying about getting it in the, the the absolute best shape and having other people look at it um uh, don't by all means don't turn anything in that's a that's a first draft that's just you're just uh, waiting for disaster to happen so it has to really be um, um free of of uh of any kind of errors or um you know uh format um that uh, problems those kinds of things yeah i would also add just you know you fill out, you send out applications to residencies and for publication and for fellowships. And because it's a subjective panel that's reading your writing, it doesn't mean that your writing is not quality writing. It could just mean that it doesn't fit what they're looking for, or what's moving them in that moment. So I think writers, it's really important that we, we realize that um, failures are part of the game and that you're looking for a percentage of wins you're not going to win everything you're not going to have everyone be a reader for you in particular and and not to take it not to be discouraged by the rejections that come in they're inevitable so another thing that we wanted to move on to was where people can find or research residencies and retreats if any of you have um, websites that you go to or lists that you have that um, you feel people could kind of um, engage with to figure out where they want to apply. I know a list is going to be sent out, but I was um, just discovering myself earlier this year. There were many that I wanted to apply to, and I and I realized, wow, all these deadlines are in January or early 
February and I hadn't realized since I'm such a new writer that there's a season, you know, for this stuff because most things happen in the summer. So I just want to throw that out there that there actually is sort of a season. Um, but you guys on the panel know more than I do. It's just that was surprising to me because I hadn't I just haven't been in the game long enough. I mean, that's such a great point, Tracy. Um, the submission schedule is such an important part of this. And I certainly have. Um, and luckily, there's actually a lot of residencies that have kind of year round. So there, there will be kind of different seasons for applying. Um, and so your challenge is to actually figure out however you keep track of things, whether it's your calendar or some other way, um, is to kind of research the things that you want to apply to and then write down their submissions periods in your calendar or wherever it is so that when it comes to that time, you'll be ready because I've definitely done the same thing that Tracy's done where I've been like, oh, I want to apply here, but it was like three months ago <laughs> that I should have applied. And so that's another really big part of the puzzle is um, figuring out how to, when to apply to these things and, and then doing it on time. <laughs> Yes, Tracy and Abir, I totally agree with you. Um, I keep track via a spreadsheet. Um, so I, I put the, the name of the residency, when the application is due, when I'm supposed to hear back, and then yes or no. And Deborah, I really liked that you talked about how um, we have to keep pushing past rejection. I think my success rate is probably around uh, 10, five to 10%. I get so 90 to 95% no's, but it's like, I just gotta let it roll off my back like water. Like I'm like a duck and the water just rolls off my back. Um, because you you don't get 100% of the opportunities that you don't apply to. I personally um, have this year been looking mostly at resident, residencies that don't have an application fee because in the past I had applied to some uh, and budgeted about a hundred dollars for like a, a one year application cycle. And I, you know, I actually didn't get any acceptances from the ones that cost money. So I was like, maybe I just apply to the free ones. And a lot of that comes from word of mouth. Um, I also dropped a link into the chat that is um, to Bomb Magazine's newsletter. They send out usually a seasonal roundup of residency and retreat opportunities. But I try to post as much as possible on my social media about opportunities that I think would be useful to other artists. And I have found out about some of my most um, fruitful residency experiences from other artists like uh, Mary Kim Arnold, the poet um, had posted about a place in Providence, Rhode Island that was ideal for like short-term residencies and it didn't cost anything to apply. It didn't cost anything to attend. And that place was called the, Red the Wedding Cake House. And I never would have found out about it if Mary Kim had not gone and posted about it on her Instagram. Another place um, that I had mentioned previously, the Peter Bulla Foundation, I uh, follow this in incredible poet, Elle Renee, on Instagram, um, and she posted about her residency at the Peter Bulla Foundation, and that's how I found out about it, and I applied and, and got in there. But so really, like, try to surround yourself with a rich community of other artists. Um, I think that's one of the pluses of social media is that even if you don't live in the same place as somebody, you can follow them and share resources, and I hope that it can be just kind of this virtuous cycle of, of sharing and, uh, and receiving. Yeah, after I, you get your first residency, you hear about this other one that sounds like you would like it because of their writing. And then it's funny how that is like a chain effect. So I think that's another way is when you get into your first residency, you find out so-and-so has been here or there and you and you feel like your writing is similar, you know, so you start matching. Uh, yeah, and I, would, I, I just want to reiterate the importance of... Um, the places that have more than just writing, right? There's this writing. I was, I, I mean, at UCross, I was thinking, oh, wow, am I going to have anything in, in common with the what conversations and, and with musicians and, and visual artists? And, and it ended up being so inspiring to me um, that I felt like I was so motivated, uh, especially as I left. Um, and so, you know, being around, I just want to reiterate, being around other types of uh, you know, don't feel like just because if they're musicians or or um, artists, visual artists, that's a, that's a place you don't want to. I would apply, um, you know, to as many 
uh, just like you do, like when you send out your work to, to magazines and just, um, you know, just, just get it out there and, and, um, you know, eventually you'll, you'll, uh, you'll land something. I, I believe that. I, I wanted to actually jump in um, and I, I, I so agree with Brandon. I like the residencies where I've gotten to talk to artists and visual artists and composers have been so rewarding. Um, but um, something just on the, that Hannah Bay mentioned about, you know, not having enough money to apply for something. So applying for the free things. I want to also just acknowledge that going to residencies is a privilege. Um, you get to like take time off from your job, maybe not you know, like have to pay rent on a place that you're not going to be staying in. And, um, and many people just don't know or have you have kids, um, you have health issues, whatever it is, um, going away for like even a weekend or a, two weeks or a month can be a privilege that not everyone is able to do. Um, and so I, and then possibly that's why a lot of these spaces are so white dominated because the POC communities often don't have that, um, those kinds of privileges. Um, but if, if there is a chance that you can sublet your place and like take a leave, um, you know, from, from a job, um, they can be really such beautiful spaces to create new work. We've been, we've been addressing, uh, questions in the feed little by little, um, Johnny, if you have any that you want us to, um, discuss, you can send them to us in the chat. I think one other thing that I would love to touch on is whether or not any of you have made connections and fellowships that have um, continued through the years. Like, did you make friends that you've taken forward or have you seen opportunities come of your time at residencies or fellowships? Oh my gosh, yes. I just talked to somebody I met in BCCA in 2011 and he, we're still very, very close. He's a composer. And he just helped me get a drummer for like a walk in the park. And um, I have another friend I met in uh, also in 2011 at Malay, who became the editor for my novel. I paid her, um, you know, for uh, two different drafts. And she is a dear friend and is also a, a visual artist as well as a, um, a writer and a very different writer than me, but a very beautiful reader for me. Um, and so I've made so many beautiful friends throughout the years that I've um, kept in touch with to, till today. I also agree with Avir. I've met really wonderful people, both writers and artists of other disciplines. Um, and, and part of it is just coming in with an open mind and an open heart and not an expectation or a sense of entitlement that, that, um, that you're gonna get something from someone. I think if you just come in and open yourself up to experiences, you just never know who you might connect with. Um, at a recent residency that I went to, there were several musicians and I was really excited just last week to find that um, one of the musicians was coming through New York City soon. And I was like, I'm gonna buy a ticket. Finally, I get to see you guys play live again. Um, so I think just coming in with like genuine enthusiasm and warmth and just kind of having the attitude of like, whatever will be, will be, um, is actually, I think it's a great way to kind of connect with like-minded souls. Yeah, I often give myself to permission to say like, it's okay if I don't connect naturally with everyone. Some people I feel very awkward around and I'm not, it's not going to change. And other people I feel very at home with them and it's, you know, that's great. I just go with what feels natural. Um, for those of you have, who have read on um, admissions committees, do you think it's important that the submitted work is something related to what the person is going to be working on it? Is there a problem when you're reading submissions if you see something that's like years old and it's like very polished, but it's just not recent and you know it's not recent? I, I don't care, actually, personally. I just think it's just important, the best work. Um, I, it, it's important to me that it's in the same genre as someone who writes in different genres, um, because the people who are gonna be reading your work are gonna be in the genre that you're applying for. Um, so I think send in the same genre, but um, yeah, when I was applying for my novel for Malay, um, there was nothing in my novel that was ready for anyone to read. So I sent them a short story instead. 
to something in fiction. So that's that's my that's my advice anyway. I don't I don't think it matters if you send something that's previously published a, a long time ago. Sometimes they'll tell you, like I think the NEA um, will say you have to send something that has been uh, written or in the last like five years or something like that. But if it doesn't say, um, then I don't think it matters. And, and in the same way, if it doesn't ex explicitly exclude you for you more kind of emerging writers, if the requirements don't exclude, exclude you, then you are eligible to apply and you should just shoot for the stars. I, I was going to um, say that when, when I read, I, it didn't matter to me um, either. Uh, I mean, the main thing is, you know, that writing sample being um, really good, but also, um, you know, the project that uh, in, in, will, will be discussed, right? I mean, it should be discussed in the uh, um, the personal statement or the project or whatever uh, that that will go in, in into detail. Um, so you know what they're going to work on, but I don't think that it, I, I don't think that it, it certainly didn't matter to me if it was older work. Um, you're just really looking for good, solid writing, right? Um, I think that, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh. Deborah, I think the only time that it matters um, when the work was created is if the application stipulates, like, please send us something that you've done in the last, I think in for NIFA, the New York Foundation of the Arts, they asked for something within like the last seven years. So, you know, it's a pretty wide range, but um, sometimes places will ask specifically for like, please send us a polished piece and then please send us something that is still a work in progress. So I think just follow the instructions and otherwise just focus on sending the best work possible. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. This is so funny. A beer jumped in on the next question that somebody asked that uh, Johnny sent over to us, which is how, how is it, how do you feel about bothering people for references for everything that you do? You know, these letters of references are so almost everybody asks for them. And a beer, do you want to share what you told, told us in the chat? Oh yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if we got to that, but I, um, first of all, I want to say how references are, I think a bit of a gate, keeping relic yes. um and i think there's some grants and residencies or fellowships that even ask they don't tell you this but they want your references to be somebody who's actually won that prize or that fellowship which you know like who knows a guggenheim i don't i'm not saying the guggenheim is the one who does it but you know i'm, I'm pretty sure there are grants out there who want that so um and so for those of us who don't have you know in sort of big shot like writers to write our references who do we get to write them get someone who can write in, um, compassionately, lovingly, um, clearly about your writing. Um, but um, what I've done is I've just, I have a little cadre of like maybe five or six people and I reach out to three of them at a time when I need a reference. And the nice thing about um, some of them are friends, some of them, one of them was my MFA advisor. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully if they've written one for you, they have that and they can just kind of tweak it. So usually I send them my resume, the statement of purpose that I'm applying with, and maybe the writing sample if they want to look at it. I don't even know if they do and it doesn't matter as long as they write me not something nice. But you want to choose somebody who you are confident is going to write something nice about you. Um, and, and then I just thank them profusely and love them forever. And we'll do anything for them because they have been doing this for me for more than 10 years now. Anyone else strategies on who you ask for your references or how you feel about references? I completely agree with a beer that they are a form of gatekeeping. Um, that being said, when a, an application does require it, I do keep a spreadsheet of people who am I, whom I've asked in the past and then people whom I might ask in the future because really anytime you interact with someone in this writing world and uh, you have a positive experience, like for example, if you've worked on a lit mag with somebody or if you have edit, been edited by somebody for a literary journal or magazine, that's a great person to ask. Um, I also think that there's nothing wrong with asking your peers. It doesn't have to be somebody who's more senior to you or somebody who has taught you. I have served as a reference um, for, for totally like on the same level as me peers. And often it's just 
for people to kind of get like a vibe check. Like, is this person going to be comfortable in this environment? For example, if there's like close living quarters, is this person somewhat flexible or is this person like somebody who really has like very particular requirements for um, their living space? You know, just things like that. Yeah, Abir also noted that you should give someone at least a month. And a lot of times what I ask people do, to do, because I write a lot of letters of recommendation are, you know, um, give me your CV, uh, maybe a couple of lines about yourself that you would love for me to kind of work or riff off of so that it makes it easier for me. Do as much work as you can. Always send, send a thank you letter afterwards. Let them know that you're grateful. Um, and everyone, and you can ask people that are your lateral peers. It doesn't have to be somebody that's really well known. Um, I think we are just about out of time, but um, is there anything that anybody would like to add at the end? I think a general recap is that what you send doesn't want to be something that's floating without context, that it has to be something that comes from the beginning or is fully drafted and feels like it's an, it's a standalone that they can really get. Um, reach, don't be afraid to reach. You can look for um, things that are free as well as things that take it like a, a fee to apply and become comfortable with rejection. Um, use the time however you like. Don't feel that there's sort of a, a template that you have to follow when you get to residency where you have to create a lot of work. Um, that's absolutely not the case. 70% of writing happens away from the desk as you're just sort of contemplating and musing things in your life. Johnny? Thank you all so much. Um, I just, just one final question because some people are looking for specific kinds of retreats for black writers, older writers, writers who have small children, various things like that. And if you Google these things, there's usually some lists that are available, but how does one sort of investigate that information? Like where do you, you should you just contact the organization directly and, and ask before beginning the application if you have certain questions for them? Uh, are you saying if you uh, know there's an organization who has these residencies already or a retreat already for that group that you're interested in? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, if you find, I mean, the, I think the trick is to actually find them, right? <laughs> so if you can find them, obviously, yes, apply. You, you can ask them um, ahead of time if, you know, you're in the right kind of group. But I think, um, yeah, finding them is the real challenge. Um, I know that there's some um, yeah, ones for parents. There's some some residencies will give for the people who can't actually come to them. Will give you the amount of money um, that would you know um, you know I say it's five thousand dollars at Malay um, like a few years ago, and they would just give you the five thousand if you were a parent who couldn't come. Um, but yeah, for other other groups, um, yeah, I think the challenge is find <laughs> just finding them. Okay. All right. Well. There's been so many great resources shared today. Thank you all so much. Uh, thanks for the, the great chat taking place in the Q&A box as well. Um, I'll collect all the information I can and include that in our follow-up email that will go out. And thanks again to Lily for, for starting that, that, that spreadsheet. It's gonna be very useful, I'm sure. All right, well, Deborah, Hannah, Tracy, Brandon, Abir, thank you all so much. Thank you thanks all. Thank you, I hope to meet you at a residency someday, everyone. I hope so too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks you, Deborah and Johnny.